welcome back to Deep Feels, the podcast that gets released every week, hosted by me, Liam Garrow. Hi, hi, hi. Um, listen, I'm flying solo this week because, you know, normally the day that AJ and I are able to record the intro, well, I was out of commission. Why? Because this bitch finally got his vaccine shot. I finally got my second shot. I am two weeks away from being fully vaxxed, which... Maybe with the Delta variant now, won't even matter. But, you know, forward momentum. Let's just, you know, get this fucking nightmare to be over. Um, Otherwise, I'm great. I hope you all are doing well. This is a great episode that I've got lined up for you here. I'm chatting with the creator. I mean, she's the creator. She's the narrator. She's the editor. She's the curator of the Be Kind Rewind YouTube uh, YouTube channel. I will never get through an intro without fucking up the name of either the guest or the thing that they are trying to promote. Never. I will never, ever get through it. Be Kind Rewind is her YouTube channel. And if you're not familiar, it's this really incredible, um, uh, you know, really whole, like, like video essay channel, really, that she's pulled together. And it's an incredible look at film and certain actors and the trajectory of their careers and You know, there's a very forward feminist um, lens through which she's looking at, you know, all of these different subject matters. And it's it's an incredible um, resource, I think, actually to have, uh, you know, to sort of have out there. So if you are a real film person or if there's even just like an actor that you really love, I bet you. She's covered them, and I bet she has this remarkably, incredibly literate, well-researched, you know, beautifully pulled together uh, video on the subject. So, Be Kind Rewind, the creator of that channel, is uh, this week's guest. And, uh, listen, I hope you enjoy the chat. Here it is. Oh my god, hi, hi, hi! Hi. Oh my god. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm great. Can I tell you what this moment feels like for me, truly? <laughs> please, please, go ahead. This honestly feels like I finally have learned the identity of Batman. This is what this moment feels like. And it's weird because my name is Bruce Wayne, so... It's honestly so crazy, <laughs> too, because, like, and the, the listeners won't be able to appreciate this, the tool belts you are wearing right now. So many doodads. It's crazy. Yeah. It, I didn't like, want to fit for my cape, but... But you can you know, I have to tell you something. Great. Honestly, the <laughs> thing about a cape is we love a statement piece. Mm-hmm. And it's important that we have a statement piece. Mm-hmm. Because I want, I want what I... I want what I'm wearing to say something before I even open my mouth. Absolutely. And I think the rubber nipples do that for me on this suit, you know? No, no question. My, (laughs) my favorite detail about that movie is when, when they were discussing, um, basically how gay Batman and Robin was, um, Mm -hmm. uh, because of Mr. Uh, Joel Schumacher. Yes. 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 And so George Clooney or Joel Schumacher was like, he was like, no, I, I don't know. I just like, made Batman the way I thought it should look. And then like literally the interview after George Clooney's like, Joel sat me down and talked to me about how he wanted this movie <laughs> to be gay. Like it was like, like there was no banding about where he was like, no, no, this is, this is exactly what is happening right now. Yeah. Which is great. I think it makes it so much more interesting. Like I'm just done with all the gritty realism, you know, like everything is filmed. like, so you can't even see it. I would much rather have that kind of like, can't be Batman that's for me well yeah. I also I almost wonder like um, maybe not but I mean like I almost wonder if like because the sort of like true comic cartoonish version of the movies was done like so well mm-hmm. but maybe there's the sense that like I don't know maybe someone has this feeling like oh it just can't be that good again maybe but you'd think that that's what they would say about like the Dark Knight or something right like you know what you're so right there is it is all very forgive the term, but it is slightly masturbatory, isn't it? Just this idea of like, look how truly dark and seedy we can be. And like, isn't it incredible that not only is this a superhero movie, but it's about something you're like, yeah. Like we can have fun. 
you know what I mean? Uh, we are missing so much of that in culture right now of just like, it's okay to admit you like a dumb thing. Like it doesn't need to be the most adult, serious thing in the world. Like and some are shooting laser beams out of their faces. Like we can who, just have fun. I cannot remember who it was just because you said laser beams and I cannot remember who it was, but like there was an actor who was talking about being in um, an acting class and they were sort of going through the motions of a scene. And I think it was for like an action film. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, so they're talking, they're sort of like dissecting the scene. And and there's a moment where of course there's like something relationship sort of heavy happening in the film. And so they're like, okay, well, you know, consider substituting relationships you've had in your own life. And, you know, think about how, you know, your real life experience can come into play in this moment. And then they got to a point where it's like, and character is chased down by a huge laser beam. And then the actor, the acting teacher paused and went, and you know, sometimes you just need to pretend like there's a big laser beam chasing after you. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, that's so true. Yeah, I think about this a lot with um, like, cause there are some actors who do Marvel who also like dabble in like a serious independent film every once in a while, you know? Yeah. And people ask them like, oh, how is it different? And it's so interesting when they talk about like, oh, I don't really feel like I'm acting that much in Disney movies because, or it just feels totally different because you're literally just acting with things that don't exist all the time. I don't- so hard. That must be such a mind fuck when you're like, my scene partner right now is a piece of green tape on the wall. Yeah. Or like, I'm talking to Rubber Hulk. Like, yeah. Those are the eyes I'm blocking with right now. Those videos though, or not the videos, sorry, the pictures of um, uh, Emma Watson with Dan Stevens when he's like in the full beast gear for Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> and it's him just in the most insanely padded costume you've ever seen in your life. And I'm like, this is how honestly I know I can't be an actor because I would look at that and be like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. Yeah, exactly. I, like, I, I think I, Dobby too. They're the oh my God. Like, Carrie is talking to like a, literally an orange on a stick. No. <laughs> Just like, good for you, son. No. Uh, it reminds me, my friend Jake, who's an actor, said something re that really made me cackle. He was like, can I be honest, Liam? He goes, I really don't want to grow as an actor i'm just i've realized i'm not interested in that he's like he goes i want to play one of two things i want to basically either play myself or i want to play middle-aged women and i was like <laughs> i really really understand that yeah 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 now wait a minute so you're in new york yes yes not to be all like sounding like your aunt and everything and talking about the weather but did you are you still in the throes of like a crazy heat wave right now no it's been over for about three or four days so okay, so okay. you've made it through to the other side. Yeah. Where, um, also, are you wearing a Barbara Streisand t-shirt? I am. <gasps> oh my God. It's for the listening audience. It's, <laughs> it's Barbara posed gorgeously, of course, with one of her like Bichon Frise, yeah, whichever. The, the dead one, I think. Oh, they're all dead. They're only dead at this point. <laughs> they're all just. The original clone one, I think. And this is Sammy? Yes, I think so. Oh. I get them confused, I'll be honest. I mean, I love Barbara, but it's really hard to keep the clones in check. <laughs> Did you remember that episode of Oprah where she had Barbara on and then Barbara sang a song that basically was uh, in memoriam to her dog that had just died? And there was a whole slideshow of her dogs just playing in the background of her singing Smile? It's amazing. That, is that when she painted the, the mic white? <gasps> yes. The, the, that's Kathy Griffin's best sequence or joke. That, Whatever. wait a minute, that and also have you seen when she's talking about when she and Cher are trying to order pizza? Yes. Yes. Okay, when she goes, um, <laughs> um, she's like, Cher, how do we get to your house? And she's like, just go to Malibu and turn re left or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I know, my favorite. And then, or like, wait, and then later she goes, um, and then she's like, they're trying to get like, um, Kathy Griffin's former assistant Tiffany on the phone to order the pizza. Tiffany, by the way, who's in LA trying to get a pizza to share and Kathy Griffin in Malibu. And then, so Tiffany's on the phone going, wait, so you want me to get pizza from where I am to where you are right now? And then literally share chimes into the call. She goes, and by the way, pref I want to preface this. My share impression is terrible, which is a real crime as a gay man. But she's like, yeah, Tiff, Kathy and I don't know how to get pizza delivered. And then it's just very like, <laughs> And then, and then the, at the end, the button, she goes, Tiff, Tiff, how does pizza happen? Which is my. 
that's awesome. You know what? I will say that that's a pretty, pretty good impression. I've heard a lot worse than that. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's really, it really is the bane of my existence when like someone's like, if I'm with another gay person and then like a gay icon comes up and then like, the thing about gay men is without even meaning to or like knowing it, it does just become a, like a very subtle competition of like who has the best blank impression. Yeah. Everybody thinks they have the best. Um, oh God, what's her name? From Lily Blonde. I'm totally oh, sorry. Jennifer Coolidge. Yes. I swear to God, everybody is convinced that they have the best Jennifer Coolidge impression. Of course, Juno Birch does. <gasps> and I think we all know that. Wait a minute. Uh, I'm sorry. I am about to really show my ignorance here. I have no idea. I've never heard this. Really? No. Yes. Um, I think she does it on her YouTube channel every once in a while. I know they've met, but it's impeccable. Well, the thing about Jennifer Coolidge is like, and I I feel like people are like, oh, Jennifer Coolidge, where does that voice come from? I'm like, it's New England. It's the most New England voice I've ever heard in my life. Are you from New England? I am not, but it's just like, I, but I just know like that when she, I heard her in an interview, she's like, I'm from New England. And then it just like pieced together. I'm like, oh my God, of course, of course, that's where that voice is from. <laughs> it never occurred to me, honestly. That's so interesting though. Because if you literally push, if you actually push the accent a bit further, I'm like, oh, you are like one of the candidates. Like, honest <laughs> to God, where it's like, because it's like, she, I will say, I'm going to be honest. My Jennifer Coolidge is not good. So this is not me thinking I have a good impression of it. But like, I mean, cause like, I mean, she does sort of have that kind of voice that really does. Yeah. There's like, like her, like it has that really kind of drawn out sort of sound. And then if you push it a bit further, it's like, she's honestly like, little lady. She's like, she's like, well, my father told me, of course, you know, that, that mother would never, ever, ever want to wear stripes on a Thursday. And then you're like, oh, that's what the voice is. Right. Okay. That's what the voice is. Yeah. And I think also that some of her characters always um, have a little bit of little Edie in them too. Yeah. It's like a little bit of um, like a neuroticism, at least with the characters that I've seen. Well, my favorite thing about, about Jennifer Coolidge is she, I think was kind of an anomaly in the comedy world. Cause she was like, so, and I'm sorry to make it about this, but you know, comedy is often so much about like overcompensating for something and usually about the physical. Right. Mm-hmm. But like Jennifer Coolidge was such an anomaly. Cause she was like, so beautiful, <laughs> like, so yeah. like in a very like, empirically beautiful way but then was like but then literally the second she opens her mouth it's like oh wait a minute you are a weirdo right and she turns it on too i think totally 100 yeah. percent. and it's i have a very similar feeling not that they necessarily mow the same lawn comedically but like it's almost like the betty gilpin syndrome of it all where it's like betty gilpin also like extremely beautiful but then it's like no you have a weird awesome cool brain yeah that's how I feel about Rosalyn Pike. People are probably sick of me doing this on Instagram, but I'm like, she's so weird. Like, if you yes. look, walk, and everything on her Instagram is so bizarre in the best way possible. Like, there was one where she was just like stranded in Prague or something and bored one night. So she spent like 15 minutes filming herself trying to open a pineapple with her bare hands. Like, she does this stuff all the time. And I'm just like, if honestly, if I were that beautiful, I would simply not develop a personality. Like, I simply would not. And I was uh, like, good for you. That's great. Love that. Well, but here's what it is. You know what it is with you and I. I think you and I are people who blossomed later. Let's mm-hmm. say that we probably blossomed later. And so we like already did the work to like finesse, you know, our stellar personalities. And now, <laughs> and now what I'm trying to say is the world just gets to reap the reward that is uh, just our general existence. Absolutely. Two for one. Oh, uh, that's, just, that's also, it's what my, that is what my lower back tattoo says. Two for one, <laughs> two for one. So wait a minute. I'm curious to know, cause I have to also tell you, and I'm sorry if compliments make you uncomfortable. And I, I, I want to not make this seem like I'm just pumping your tires for the hell of it. I need to tell you, however, um, I became aware of you quite early into your YouTube channels sort of development. And like, I honestly, I, there's a very good chance I became aware of, 
your channel like with the first or second video. Um, and from the jump, I was so struck at how, not only like how polished and like, and, like wonderful they were, but I was not unlike kind of any of the women we've been talking about. Like I was so immediately intrigued by your brain. Cause what's incredible about what you do on your Be Kind Rewind channel, all of your videos not only are so deeply researched and so impeccably put together, but I also really love that your personal set of ethics and your personality is in those videos and how you have a very forward feminist um, point of view with your videos and all that to say, I just think you do the most amazing job on your channel, honest to God. Oh, well, thank you so much, though. That's really, really nice to hear. I do appreciate that a lot. Well, and, I, and I'm and i sure pulling those videos together is no easy feat between the actual execution and the research. And I'm curious to know, I mean, there's so much I want to know uh, about you and sort of how you've, you know, come, came to love film and everything. But I am curious to know, even just with the channel specifically, how did the Be Kind Rewind channel even come to be? Where did that sort of idea sort of germinate from? So I, I guess like the origin of it is that I did not major in film or anything like that, but I was always a fan of it. Um, and sort of like the second I graduated from, from college, I was like, oh, actually this thing I've been studying for four years, I don't like it. And, and what were um, you studying? I was studying international relations. Uh huh. And so I basically was like, okay, what do I actually care about? I care about movies. I want to work in movies somehow. Um, so I started working in like content strategy and like video and stuff like that at tech companies. Um, and so I was basically just kind of figuring things out. Like I wanted, I knew I wanted to work with video or film or something like that, but I didn't know how exactly. Um, and then one day I went to the film museum in Germany, in Berlin, and I was like, holy shit, like there are literal places that you can go and like talk about film history. And that's what I love. So it became my goal to actually work in film history somehow, or like work at a, at a film festival or something like that. Um, so basically I was like, okay, how do I prove that I'm the right person to work in these places. And I was like, well, maybe I can work in marketing or social media or something like that. So I'll just start a channel where I can basically prove that I have a certain skill set, I have a certain knowledge base, and then I can use that to like talk about in interviews. Um, and it'll basically be like a portfolio. So that's why I started. I never started it to try and like get attention in any way. I never started it to um, like have it be a personal brand or anything like that. Right, it's right. Really just like I want to get these jobs, like how do I get them? Um, and it kind of works. Like I work in a museum now, which is like pretty, it was the goal. Um, so, but yeah, it just kind of took off in a way that I wasn't expecting. And um, because of the people I've met through it and the full moment I found through it, I was like, I can't stop doing this. Like, right. Just keep going. So, well, it's, you know, it's also very, here's another interesting, I think, element of your videos and it tags off the point that you made about you not really wanting attention for it because even in the press that you've received surrounding the videos, like, unless I miss something, I don't even know that your full name exists out in the world. Nope. <laughs> right. And so, I and that's, not do. Yeah. well, totally. And that's why I was like, even in our communication, I was like, and I'm also happy to not mention it, even if you want it to like really not be out there. But I was like, I was like, is, I'm like, is this, if I do address you by name, like, is it this? And you were like, yes. And I'm like, okay, great. Like, you know, <laughs> um, and even, you know, on your Twitter, like you are at BK Rewinds, like there's mm -hmm. no mention of your name and which all that to say, I was like, oh, I, I think this is also what people are so drawn to though with the channel is like, it's so obviously a genuine comment on your just true adoration of whatever the subject is that you're covering and it's so not about ego yeah i mean i don't really care about like me <laughs> not in like an unhealthy way or anything but like, no i understand i just don't think like when when i make something i want it to be 
uh, I want people to watch it because they want to learn about that thing. They want to learn about Jane Fonda. They want to learn about Betty Davis. Like mm-hmm. what, what is me? Well, I, what do I add to that? Like I can add my knowledge, but like if it's me there because you like the sets that I make or because you like the makeup I have on, then that doesn't mean as much to me. Like I want it to, I want the first thing you notice to be the work that I've done. And that's a lot harder when there's like a personality involved and sets and like fashion and other elements. So I just try to detach myself from it. And it's also like a privacy thing just because people are kind of (laughs) crazy. Well, sure. No kidding. (laughs) I mean, have you had to contend with it? Because I'm not like, I am not a person who puts myself out, you know, like on YouTube and stuff, but you know, um, I am also generally even like with even with things I'm not involved in, like I'm actually not a comments reader mm-hmm. because I, I, I already know what exists in comments because there's no, there's never, as I'm sure you do, there's no middle ground of, there's not a nuanced opinion in comments. It's either you absolutely love something or you absolutely hate something, right? Yeah. I don't need to disseminate from there, right? Like I don't need to know any specifics. Have you found it bizarre having your work be sort of, um, like what's your relationship been like with comments and with people being able to sort of have, you know, uh, a say and an opinion in, uh, you know, as much of a way as they do, you know, with what you post online? Mm-hmm. Um, I would actually say my comment section is pretty good for the most part. I mean, yes, I knocking on wood. Let's keep that yeah, going. For real. Yes. For real. Um, I think it helps that I'm not in it. Sometimes I get comments about my voice, but very rarely, um, you have a very, just by the way, for the record, you do have a very good speaking voice. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And the, I think I kind of had to learn to train it a little bit because in the beginning, everyone was telling me I had vocal fry and I realized that's cause I was trying to make my voice lower cause I wanted to sound like Kate Blanchett, but I mean, unfortunately, <laughs> I mean, anyway, um, but yeah, I think my, my comment section is pretty good. Like people are generally, um, thoughtful I think for the most part I think sometimes you get a video where it sort of crosses a threshold where like the normal target audience for the video like has spread a little bit or it's it's right yeah reaching a little bit of a wider net casting a wider net um and that's when it starts getting a little funky you know yeah um so for example, like I made that video about Harvey Weinstein, um, with Nicole Kidman. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I was expecting a lot of fighting about Harvey specifically, but somehow it turned into QAnon, like who apparently thinks Nicole Kidman's dad is a pedophile. <laughs> and so Good I had to get all of those. Yeah. And get rid of all of that. Like sometimes it gets weird, but I, I would say that I'm very thankful for the most part people are pretty good. Well, it's such an interesting, I mean, it's also incredible what people are able to sort of like take and run with. And I mean, I've even just experienced that a little bit on the Twitter sphere. Like I, wait a minute, I had a thing. I like, this is also how dumb Twitter is. I like literally posted something about Cher on her birthday and it like went viral for no reason for, I mean, except for that, I guess people love Cher and want it. Great. Isn't that wonderful? (laughs) Uh, and it doesn't, it, it all comes back to share with you and I, but like, I remember though in the comments, it managed to like, and understandably, I think the person posting, I'm going to say English is not their first language. And so fine. There's, I think maybe a lot uh, getting lost in translation there, but like it managed to go, I think it like it, it managed to basically sort of spread out from like, isn't share wonderful to like questioning her gender. And then how yeah, I get that a lot. I get that all the time. I think it's like a QAnon thing. People are, people spend a lot of time throwing transphobic slurs at actresses. It's really wild. Weird. It's or like, um, I don't know if you've ever encountered this, but like, because I'm not watching these videos, but like, because I, I am a person who will just like want to look up, you know, old interviews with Sally Field, because that's mm-hmm. who I am. Mm-hmm. And like, and you're like, you know, you're coming through YouTube, coming through YouTube, and then it's like, um, Sally Field conspiracy theory, secretly a reptile, and like, yeah. that's a thing with some like basically this this like conspiracy theory of you know celebrities are all just these secret lizard people, and you're like, okay. It's very weird. I, I don't. Do. Know. It's I'm. It's so beyond my understanding. 
<laughs> like I, I have totally. no even fathoming it's, the beginning of understanding what that is, you know? Well, and it's very, that's why it's true. It does make it very difficult to speak to because it's so beyond the threshold of how your brain works where it's like, I don't even know how to fabricate an answer that would like justify like, oh, I can see how X would think this. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Are there things happening right now? Because of course, you know, we've come off of a very bizarre, I mean, for not only just with movies, just a bizarre time generally, but if we're talking specifically about movies, of course, you know, COVID really affected the whole movie landscape in terms of how movies are able to be watched, our general accessibility to them. Of course, this affects, you know, the whole award show campaign, but were there sort of things happening within movie culture either in the last year or more specifically now that have really sort of jumped out at you that you've thought like god isn't that interesting oh that really sort of pulled at your interest there yeah um i mean i definitely think the simultaneous release schedule is interesting um i'm not exactly sure how that's going to go moving forward but for example releasing in the heights the same day in theaters and on hbo max Mm. Um, I sort of assumed that would like die with COVID, I think. Um, but I think that was maybe a very bad assumption. Um, I, I don't know what's going to happen with it moving forward. And I think people always over exaggerate like the death of the theater. I don't think theaters are, will be completely gone. Um, I think it'll be just more of a accessibility question. Like if you live in a smaller town, that might be harder for you. Um, but yeah, I'm just really interested to see where that goes and how it affects how we watch movies or how we pay attention to them. I know when I watch things at home, I do a much worse job <laughs> paying attention. 100% same, <laughs> um, same. So like, it's never my preference to, to watch things at home, but I'm also a, a human being. I get lazy, I get cheap, and sometimes that happens. Um, so I don't know, we'll see. Well, I also wonder about, you know, because I think so much of watching and like going to a physical theater really is very experiential, of course, in a way that watching a movie at home is not. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but wonder if, if we really did lose movie theater culture in a big way, I actually do wonder if that would impact then the kinds of movies that get made, because I would assume a big part of what is sort of going into the green lighting process for a lot of these movies is like, and imagine the experience you'll have being, seeing it in a big theater. And then it's like, but then if you don't have that, what does that do to the sort of the currency of that project? You know, I mean, we were, well, we've seen this so many times before. I mean, there's the actual historical precedent for that is like the early fifties when you have these big MGM color, technicolor musicals, right? Mm -hmm. Like they want to lure you out of your home because you don't have the technology to replicate that at home. So I right. mean, like technically, yes, I guess you could still say that with like Marvel and stuff like that. But I could also see like, what if, um, what if Paramount comes out with a brand of like home theater equipment? And then- Oh, you know, isn't that interesting. Like monetizing that way. So- who knows? I mean, I feel like there are a bunch of ways they can monetize it, like around not going to theaters as well, you know? You're so smart. I hadn't even thought of that, right? Of like basically bringing the theater experience to you. Well, right. and it's like I Apple and you have to buy a new one like every two minutes. Right. Oh, fascinating. Because I was even, I would think I was playing the other angle of that of like, if movie studios were like, let's say, let's say such a time did exist where, okay, we're not going to movies, and everyone really is now just in droves staying at home and watching things on either, you know, with the USB cord, USB cord connected to the TV or just watching it on their little 13 inch, app, 13 inch laptop. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they were like, okay, well, if we're not really selling them the specter of these huge sort of epics that maybe would be really enticing in a big theater, like I almost wonder if the opposite would happen, which maybe then people would embrace making more smaller movies. Yeah, it's possible. Um, I don't know. I mean, I just wonder where the monetary, the biggest monetary benefit would be for them. And I feel like more and more we're getting away from the kinds of movies that I really like, which right. are like smaller independent dramas and stuff. So I don't know. We'll see. What were some of the movies that came out recently that have really grabbed you where you were like, ugh, incredible. Um, I loved Sound of Metal. <gasps> that was great. 
Can I tell you something? I, no joke, literally saw it for the first time two weeks ago. Oh, in, really? Incredible. Yeah, it's great. Incredible. It's one of those things where it's like, I never would have known that I would have wanted to watch that movie. Same. You know what I mean? And it just surprised me so much. And it was so beautiful. Even like until the last second, like the mm-hmm. ending is gorgeous. Yeah. The thesis statement, you know? Uh, yeah. Wow. I really love that movie. I don't know. I'm Are there... to think about 2020. I feel like it was a lot of like, like nothing really struck me, but I feel like it was a weird year. Yeah. It, w- it was really hard to it all feels like so for me so many things i'm sure it was so frustrating for people releasing movies but my god so many things got lost in the fold didn't they yeah like yeah, it doesn't help i mean i think the the like whole rollout on like netflix and stuff like that i mean if you don't watch it in the first like 48 hours that it drops there's no conversation about it at all right like, is a blip on twitter and that's it um but I, I even find that's generally true, even if like a film does sort of have like a presence or, or like, let's say it does sort of hit, let's say on a streaming mm-hmm. platform, it's shelf life, it seems in terms of the cultural conversation still only lasts 48 hours. Like yeah. uh, the one that I can think of where like, and I'm sure you and I follow a very similar crowd on, on Twitter and people follow us, but like, I remember when Barb and Star Visit v- Vista Del Mar right. came out. Right. That was like a huge, like everyone was like, oh my God, we need this pick me up and this big, colorful, silly movie. Good, 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 good. And then, so let's say it was released on Friday and then by Monday it was like, no one t- was talking about it again. Right, right, right. That's really true. And it's just like, and I just was like, wow. Like, but isn't that interesting? And maybe there is then a benefit to having films getting a proper theatrical release, if not only for the fact that like, they get to just live longer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. Agree. I think that's the only way to sort of keep up with the weekly release schedule that's keeping like Mayor of East Town and like Mandalorian and all of these shows that yes. uh, are really just present every single week and you can anticipate people talking about it. Um, you know, it's a lot harder to do with movies because you can't space things out that way. But yeah, um, we're not gonna really we're not gonna release it, you know, thirty minutes at a time. Of the Irishman. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, I, do you want to know something? That was just one of those. I, there must be movies for you and I, where you're like, even just on the surface, you look at it and your brain just goes, you know what? No. Oh, yeah. All the time. Yeah. All the time. Um, I mean, that's how I feel about literally like every Disney movie that comes out. I'm just like, have fun, but I'm not watching this. Like, I can't do it anymore. Yeah, like I also am not because I think so. On the day that you and I are speaking, I think Luca just came out today, right. the new the I'm new Pixar adventure. <laughs> well, my thing is like, okay, but I don't need to watch the animated conglomerate Call of Call Me by Your Name and The Shape of Water. Like, I just don't need that for me. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't need it. I never find myself being like, oh, I should, I should watch Soul. Which I know a lot of people love that. I, movie, do you want to know something? And that's yeah. one of those things where I'm like, I bet you if I sat down and watched Soul, I'd be like, you want to know something? That was so good. But right. I don't, I, not unlike yourself, I don't have any interior mechanism where I'm like, let's sit down and spend two hours doing this now. Yes, exactly. Like, I, exactly that. I know I would probably enjoy it, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Are, now, are, I'm curious to know also... Because, you know, you mentioned Mayor of Easttown, and I, I agree. I think, and I, this is a pivot, of course, to television, but, like, I do think the release and rollout schedule for that was so smart because I think it also really benefited, like, the general tone and, like, the edge of your seatness of that show, right? When you're just like, fuck, what is going to happen next week? But do you, do you think your channel or are you interested in your channel ever, like, making a pivot to television content? Or are you thinking, like, no, I really want to s- sort of stay down the lane of film? Um, I have a couple of ideas that I think touch on television. Um, I am really interested in Reese Witherspoon as a producer. Okay. Um, And and, and what's striking, what's really kind of like struck you about her in that capacity? Um, I think there's something about the, the books that she's choosing to adapt that are like very specific to like, the white womanhood of Americans right now. Mm-hmm, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. Or like this very uppity, like 
neurotic perfectionist women that she chooses and like centers a lot of her work around um that's really interesting um so that's that's for example an idea that i would like to to dissect at some point but um, yeah. I think the whole, I think it's really, I mean, incredible that like so many actresses are like, especially the, the actresses who are, let's say like north of 40, who are mm-hmm. like, are these the scripts we're getting? No. And so then they are now totally in the driver's seat for their own material. And, and the thing that I think is a real point of distinction between um, uh, actresses who are pivoting to um, produce producerial roles versus actors who are doing the same because women, by and large, as it compares to men, are readers. Men are not. <laughs> right? That's interesting. Wait, so say more about that. So there was a statistic I read, probably, I think it was from the New York Times. I think it, this must have been 15 years ago. But basically, the statistic was that men, after their last, whatever, whatever their um, most, like, current or whatever their last interval of education was 75 percent of men after that point never read another book again that's shocking but then also when you think about it think of all the men you know that are not really avid readers right like and funny and so it's really interesting to me then when you look at like um a reese witherspoon when you look at um a Nicole Kidman, um, uh, uh, there are others, I, or um, even, granted, uh, she was not an actress first, but, you know, even, like, Genji Cohen with Orange is the New Black, turning that into, you know, um, a series, like, the, you know, women are looking, like, these are women who are just, like, reading in their lives, mm-hmm. and they're reading for pleasure, and then they're, like, and because of the way that their brains are wired and the industry that they happen to be and they go, you know what, this would be a great thing for blah, 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 mm-hmm. you know, like, I believe all of Reese Witherspoon's projects, Wild, Big Little Lies, and Little Fires Everywhere, have all been yep. adaptations of books, right? Yep. Yeah. And so, and then it's really incredible because then presumably their audience base, I'm going to assume also largely female, are probably also by and large more avid readers than their male counterparts and probably in a lot of cases have read these books and are like yes let's capitalize on let's 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 enjoy the extension of the brand here with this book that we loved so much Mm -hmm. yeah that totally makes sense yeah and i think it's you know and i'm and i know you probably have a lot of you know um information on this because i have a feeling that you and i really like if you and i had to distill like our favorite thing it would just be like women in the 70s Yeah, I mean, that's that's up there for me. That's a yeah, top three. That's yeah. A top three. yeah, yeah. And you know, when you look at, um, but the late seventies, of course, was really interesting because this is also when a lot of female actors were starting to produce. Mm-hmm. Goldie Hawn, Jane Fonda, um, and I certainly know Sally Field. Then ventured into that world a little bit. I think more towards the eighties. But their whole thing was like looking at what were the, like the socio political issues going on at the time, and then they made movies out of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's interesting. I feel like, um, hmm, I, I definitely want to look at like what books were adapted like during the seventies and eighties, like starring women specifically. Well, I want, do you want to know something offhand? I can't think of a single one, but I would almost like, I would almost be interested to work backwards from this. Cause if I had to make a guess, I bet you they're all kind of like psych psychological thrillers that are very much about like the melodrama of someone's interior life right yeah is terms of endearment a book i think it was i'm just like uh i don't know (laughs) wait a minute i will i mean terms i'm also googling terms of endearment book uh yes there you go yeah i feel like did someone, did the writer, um, like, recently die or something? That's why I'm thinking about it. Yes, because it was um, Larry McMurtry, who I believe also wrote the short story for Brokeback Mountain, yes? Oh, God, I don't know. The I one, th- the thing, here's the thing that is, like, horrible for me, is that my, like, name recall and just general vocabulary recall, like, on the fly is bad. And so, like, whenever I try 
to talk about things that I literally spend all day thinking about. I'm like, who's that? Who is that name? Oh, like, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be the worst 80 year old on the planet because I won't remember my own name at that point. I will say, Larry McMurtry, he he co-wrote the screenplay for Brack, Bo- Broke Back Mountain. So that's so that's where I pulled that from. But I want you to know, I was actually just chatting with my friend. Um, Tom Zohar, who's been on the show, and he was, he and I were actually having this exact conversation of like, he and I are approximately the same age, like early 30s, and he and I were just having this conversation of like, oh no, no, this is bad. Like, if it's this bad now with our memories, yeah. like, terrified. Yeah. 30 years from now, terrified. I am terrified. I'm, yeah, I'm pretty terrified too. My, oh, this is actually dark, sorry, but my grandma Please. has Alzheimer's. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm, I'm like, sorry. Oh, I'm so that. sorry. Yeah, for me. <laughs> right. Um, and yeah, no, it's terrifying. I, I also do think it's like partly from my phone. Just oh no no no, it is. Okay, I'm just I just don't retain anything. They, no, they have linked it to that actually, because because you're not having to memorize. Like, it's so funny. Like you and I, I'm going to assume you and I are approximately the same age. Yeah, I'm 30. You yeah okay, me too. So um, <laughs> me too. Um, <laughs> but like you, but you and oh, I. Birthdays. Hey, wait, when is your birthday? My birthday is April 9th. <gasps> I'm March 29th. Oh, oh my God. Aries, we are doing it. See, this the is all- distinct, The distinct pleasure of turning 30 during the pandemic. I know, the distinct, and then also the distinct pleasure of having two COVID birth, birthdays. Wow. What a thrill. I know. I'm celebrating 30 again next year. It's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna- oh, that's- yeah, I'm just going to be like Zsa Zsa Gabor and you're just never going to know. That is honestly so smart. I have to say this really quickly about Zsa Zsa Gabor. She was conducting a press conference one like 800 years ago. And there was a reporter that said, asked something to the effect of like, um, Zsa Zsa, what do you say to, um, um, you know, animal advocates who criticize your use of, you know, um, uh, feathers in your boas from endangered birds? And she goes, oh, don't be silly, darling. Feathers, they don't come from birds. They come from pillows. Oh no! <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'm like, oh, to to have to live in a world that simple. What a dream! But I was gonna say, like, you and I though would have made up the last without, and we wouldn't have realized this was the case because no one ever thinks they're gonna be the last generation to do something. But like, you and I would have been the last generation to memorize phone numbers. Yeah. No, we're the, I feel like our generation is so weird. And I think about this all the time. Like specifically if you were born between like 90, 89 to like 94, probably. Right. Like we're the last to really grow up without cell phones, without the internet. Mm -hmm. Like the shift on social issues for us is so radical. Like from when I grew up, like watching what happened to Ellen to like now, like the way that we're talking about LGBTQ issues, it's like night and day. I know. And it's like that was so many different things. And we we were like in the front of it. And so we experienced one half, but we're also like young enough to experience the other half. So it's like, so it's so odd to me. Well, I've always said that uh, the nineties was sort of, I think the last vestige of innocence for kids. And, 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 and not to say that that was in, and it's a mixed bag, that statement, because of course there are certain things I think maybe that we're aware of now that of course that are very, very good. Yeah. But like, I don't know. I don't, and I don't mean this with respect to social issues. Like, it's so funny. There's a whole conversation now of like, should we teach our white children what racism is? It's like, (laughs) sorry, why are you not teaching your white children what racism is? But anyway, but I'm talking more about like, it's funny. I have a, I, uh, I have a friend who is, um, uh, he's in his 50s and he has children that were born uh, probably like in the early 2000s. But he, rem- but of course, you know, he would have been like an adult of, you know, in the 90s and late, ni- late 90s and so on. And we were talking about the um, Bill Clinton and Mona Lewin- Monica Lewinsky scandal. Right, right, right. And, and, and I said, oh God, I said, you know, of course, because, you know, even though you and I were little kids when that happened, like I remember it, you know. That's how I remember oral sex was. <laughs> you so this is exactly so i was talking to him about this very thing and then he said do you want to know what i he would he's this is him talking now he goes you know what i thought was really like the cut the shitty thing about that whole thing of course a lot of things like the inner turmoil for that for those for the families involved that like that had to have been awful but just generally he's like it really sucked 
that no pun intended so that was awful i did not mean for that to happen but he's like it was really terrible for like an eight-year-old to now all of a sudden know what a blowjob was right it's like does like doesn't does a kid need to know that like and i do worry about children generally having like so much access to stuff for like their little tiny undeveloped brains yeah i mean i think about like how horny like the the 13 year old boys were when i was in grade school you know and like Mm -hmm. knowing now that they're just that horny but they also have like unlimited access to porn is like kind of crazy well you have to have like a lot of maturity to deal with it and to be honest like I don't know. Nobody's teaching them that, I think. Well, because... Oh, here's a weird... Can I tell you this weird story? Uh, Oh, my God, of course. Okay, so I... When I worked... um, I worked at a video app. (laughs) I'll just keep it vague. Yeah. And um, they... I started working there at the time they, like, decided they were no longer allowing explicit content. So it was my job to, like make sure that all of that was taken off of the app. And so I have seen every disgusting thing Mm -hmm. that anyone has ever put on the internet, all of it, like murder, everything. (laughs) And um, uh, what I learned from that experience was like a lot of kids don't know um, the consequences of like filming themselves doing things. Like, like there's no health class to be like, Hey, like if you're curious about X, Y, Z, like that's okay. And totally healthy. But also here's what you need to know about like responsibly exploring that. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Well, right. It's it's like they don't. And it's very Yes. Well, it's like, and they don't even understand the consequence of like having something like holding something in your brain. Yeah. Right. Like, and actually there is a thing happening now with teenagers because it's so funny because when you and I were 13 I actually and maybe this was my own total like I'm sure my relationship to this being gay and then not like wanting to really hide my sexuality and then you know you try and Mm -hmm. skirt around all those things like I'm maybe this was my own sort of um, willful ignorance of it but like I also don't remember being 11 12 13 and having other guy friends discussing sex really and like Mm -hmm. I like and I remember kind of you know people starting to date and stuff in that sort of very innocent way that teenagers do but like that stuff conversationally was still so under rug swept and there weren't really like immediate tools to be able to sort of like suss that out really but Mm -hmm. I there is a thing now happening which is very troubling which is that because and this is happening with boys especially because they do have so much access to the internet and then of course to whatever thing that they are curious about looking up they are now actually developing something called porn brain which is warping their ideal of what they think sex is supposed to look and feel like oh wow that when they i my understanding is that so now when like young men in their teens early 20s whenever when they're starting to first have like actual sexual experiences they are having a really hard time connecting and or deriving any real sexual pleasure from it because it goes against the idea of what they think sex is based on porn. Right. Wow. You know, this kind of connects to like that, um, one of Twitter's favorite film debates, which is should sex scenes be in movies? Oh, right. Which I think is like, personally, I think it's a dumb question. Like I do think obviously that they should be. It's like one of the most human things in the world. Like, yeah. why not? Um, but it's funny that that sort of co- coincides with like some of the least sexy cinema ever has been in like the past couple of decades, like mm-hmm. clocking out, you know, how much time is spent like with intimacy in, in like in movies is just at an all time low. And I think that's so interesting uh well because it's like, almost it going? <laughs> well and i wonder if maybe an element of that is because this is okay so i'm only piecing this thought together now so let's see how articulate i get to be about it i wonder if an element of why sex and film in the 70s and 80s was so interesting was because it was also so novel 
And so there was a real, and because it was new, there was the sense of really wanting to sort of make it interesting on film and also have it not only look interesting, but having it serve as a real, um, because particularly because it would have been a far more conservative um, society then, yeah. you really wanted to make sure that if it was going to be there, it really served the story so that it wasn't coming off as um, gratuitous. Mm-hmm. Although I think a lot of it does. Oh, I, yes, certainly, certainly. Especially, like, through the 90s. I mean, I always feel bad for, like, when Sharon Stone talks about what happened to her on Basic Instinct. I'm just like, uh, oh, my God. I know. I can't imagine. But then I wonder, but then I also do wonder if there was an element of, like, when people were sort of made to feel like they could start to show sex in film, like, that's why they did. Mm-hmm. And now, because it was probably also, like, this, like, interesting, maybe... Uh, I hate to be so base about it, but I wonder if it was kind of like an excuse to also provide titillation a little bit. But oh, totally, yeah. Because we have those venues <laughs> by the multitudes now, and certainly far more graphic and far more explicit. I wonder if maybe the reason why there's been a real sort of downturn in what we're seeing in movies is because people are like, well, we don't feel as invested in showcasing that because we can kind of sort of get our fill of that elsewhere. Yeah. That's really interesting. I mean, I think like from what I've seen, I feel like when sex is portrayed now, it's uh, sort of more, how do, what's the right word to describe it? It feels more like almost burdensome or like it's trying to express some t- kind of like stress or like mm. um, fear maybe. Like, When I, for example, when I watch movies, I watch a lot of movies from the 30s and 40s when, like, they couldn't show (laughs) sex or, like, sex is panning to a fireplace, you know what I mean? Right, right. Um, But at the same time, I feel like those are so much hotter than things we see now. Like, because they have to take so much care to be, like, how do we convey that these two people are, like, two seconds from banging it out? Like, what do how do we show that? And so you can have just like a quick, like touch of the chin or something like that. That is very, very intimate, not at all lustful or like showy, but does the job really well. And I feel like we don't even do that really anymore. Now it's just like, oh, right. we just got in a fight. And now we're going to fuck. <laughs> well, like, okay. because in, in those movies, like, you know what they're really playing with though? Like when you talk about like, oh, like someone touching a cheek, having that be so like, <gasps> like, because yeah. they're playing with tension. Yeah, exactly. Like, they're really, they're not playing with tension now. And I think I, it's, it's interesting what you brought up also. I think how sex now is really ha- meant to be like a conduit for like helping to articulate like, a moment of discomfort or awkwardness now in a storytelling yeah. like and it's not really about like the joy of a sexual relationship between these between two people you know what i mean i think that's a really interesting point um and i think see now i'm have i'm having a little we were talking about forgetting things i'm now having a moment where i'm forgetting things um, <laughs> but you know it's interesting because i just think like in the 30s and 40s yes they had to be so careful with what they were showing and It almost, you know what it actually makes me think of? When, and I know people have a lot of very mixed feelings about the show, and I'm not trying to like wave the flag, being like, it's the best comedy ever. But like, (laughs) it's, um, it's really interesting, you know, because on The Office, of course, the whole, I think a big element of what made the Tim Don, Jim Pam relationship so kind of delicious for people is because they were constantly playing with tension. Yeah. Because yeah. they have this added on construct of we, these characters know they're being watched. So there's an inherent emotional information of they know there's a certain way they can't behave. Yep, exactly. And especially when they were building up to having, you know, the actual relationship, it's like the magnitude of everything, kind of what you're talking about with like, oh, what touching someone's face means or what holding someone hand, someone's hand means. It's like, it takes on such a different magnitude because it's like, oh, there's this, and there's this added on layer of like we know that there's so much they can't show so when we're given like this little taste of it we're like oh it's so incredible and even so the most kind of modern example i can think of it is like you know if jim and pam sort of had like a lingering glance at each other from across the office it's like as an audience we were like oh yeah, my god episode. yeah yeah i mean there are so many i think the best relationships on tv are like that like i think Mulder and scully are kind of like that mm-hmm. um moonlighting was kind of like that um where it's, it's almost like a will they, won't they from week to week. And obviously like 
some of those didn't end up with each other or whatever, but um, yeah, no, that's so, that's so great. You know, it's like Mayor will like, will she or won't they with her vape? I mean, like, let's see what happens. And guess what? As it turns out, she always would. She, she always will. would. Yeah. She said yes. She said yes. <laughs> but I think, I thought that was so interesting how they just like dangled Guy Pierce and then he just left. Do you know what I mean? Isn't that so weird? But I'm interested. Like, I loved it, kind of. It was so random. I. For you do not understand how much I'm in love with you right now. I love that you're bringing up this idea because I have wanted to turn to someone to be like, isn't it incredible that they managed to get Guy Pierce for a show where he did nothing? Yeah, literally nothing. Literally nothing. He shows up in Mare's life a few times. They have like kind of uncomfortable sex. Yeah. And that's, and that's it. it. Yeah, and then he leaves. It's like, I couldn't really, I think, I mean, ultimately it, it seemed like it was just there to sort of like give her character, like, I don't know, round her out, see what she was interested in romantically or something. But then the fact that it just amounted to nothing is so funny. It almost like could not have existed and the show would be exactly the same. Well, I couldn't and- tell if they were trying to make us think that he was a suspect or not. Oh, yeah, I thought maybe that was a device, but I also more, it's funny, I didn't suspect him ever. I really, I think it was the latter. I think it, uh, or the former rather, when you were sort of saying like, I think it was them trying to sort of flesh out her character. And I think in some ways, because I think in the beginning, it's like her just like trying to get her life on track and trying to imbue some sense of normalcy. And so what's perfectly normal for an adult? It's like, well, you know, maybe like find some, companionship and then you know but of course it's like the thing about mayor not to be so trite but it's like she she can't date a person because she's in a relationship with her job right like that's right that's and with her yeah. parents hopefully like <laughs> right yeah right <laughs> that done you know yeah get that work happening now i will say i don't want to keep you too long you've been very generous with your time so we need to let people know that your YouTube channel is Be Kind Rewind. People should subscribe and like videos. Absolutely. You're on Twitter at BK Rewind. Yep. And are there any sort of other things you want to like tease out for people? This is going to be out in like a few weeks. Are there things you want to sort of plug? Um, okay. In a few weeks. Okay. I am publishing a video about Madonna in like <gasps> three days, hopefully. So watch that. <laughs> I, I'm so excited about it. Can I tell you? I'm so excited. You I, don't. I, I co-wrote it with um, Sydney Urbanek. I hope I'm saying the last name right. But uh, she, she's the one who uh, like is the Madonna writer on, um, on the internet. She wrote that article about her and David Fincher. Oh. Yeah. She's the best. She is incredible to talk to and work with so i'm really excited about it we put together a really good script i i'm i i realize in the context of how i'm meeting you maybe i don't mean for my excitement to seem performative or like a thing that i need to be doing in the construct of like trying to like amp up whatever you're trying to do for this interview i am so excited (laughs) i oh that's gonna be so good yeah i'm pretty pumped it's about like um because she uses so many classic film references in her music videos and her tours and stuff. So it's Certainly. like breaking down the like different figures that she basically tries to emulate and then why she chooses them and like what they say about the 80s and 90s specifically. So <gasps> it's so interesting. And she was, it's funny, you know, she's very interesting to me. I mean, for a litany of reasons, but I mean, also mm-hmm. like I really think Madonna's whole thing her whole life is she wanted to be a movie star, not a music superstar. Probably, yeah. And I think there's also, <laughs> and I think there's also kind of like the interesting thing there, like, of like what becomes, like what becomes your actual life versus what you kind of maybe thought or wanted your life to be. Like, like here's also an interesting thing, like because I watched the Tina Turner documentary, which was like incredible. And if you've not seen it, please, please do. It's so so good. But like Tina Turner her idols were not musicians. Her idols were actresses and very um, like women of film in the forties and fifties, like very regal and refined. And Tina Turner wanted to be a movie star. Right. And throughout, 
like throughout her whole life, she was always wanting scripts and scripts and scripts. And, you know, she famously turned down the role of Celie in The Color Purple. Oh, I actually didn't know that. Wow. The, the, Steven Spielberg approached her and Tina Turner's whole thing. She was like, no, no, no. She's like, sorry, I already lived this. Like mm -hmm. I, like, she's like, I don't need to, I don't need to dramatize this. I've already done that. And Tina Turner's whole thing. She's like, I only, I love how upfront she was about it. She's like, I don't really want to like act. I want to do something that's like heightening my personality. And I want to be in action movies. <laughs> that would have been so good. And so okay. she was only really in two movies her whole life. Cause she of course was in Tommy. And then she was in Mad Max Thunderdome and she loved that experience. But like that, she never, but then she's like, every single time I got a script, it was for this really downtrodden woman who was a sex worker and addicted to drugs. And she was like, I can't do it. I can't do it. Yeah, exactly. That's Not like, like Barbara Streisand. She thought she was going to be, she wanted to really just be an actress and then only sang because she couldn't get work. Mm -hmm. And then never sang again. She, although I did go her tour, hence the shirt. Oh. And um, <laughs> I, I wish, it, I don't know if you went to it, but like those things are the funniest to things to watch it's incredible is it is it hilarious i so i have not had the pleasure of seeing her live and i suspect now maybe i never will but is an element of the comedy from those tours having everything to do with just how precisely every moment is scripted every moment is scripted but it's also like the way that things are produced looks like they were made in like 1987 right you know what I mean like it's not it's not um it's not beautiful like digital work like when they project things onto the screen it's like very Microsoft Paint I was literally gonna say isn't it like Microsoft Paint oh my god yeah. that's so funny um so but like of course it's all of these like women who are in their like 50s 60s 70s like sobbing literally sobbing the woman in front of me cried through all of evergreen and i that was my favorite thing <laughs> oh my god <laughs> i i saw fleetwood mac live once I'll, I'll share the story and then i promise i will let you go i <laughs> saw fleetwood mac live once and or it may have even actually been stevie nicks performing solo but all that to say of course it's me and like every single 60 year old woman you've ever seen in your entire life and of course it's like women who maybe and men who have not really like had a night out in a while yeah so I swear to God, every single person that was like over the age of 50 was so trashed, like oh, yeah. so, so drunk. And I just remember like a woman who I'm going, I'm going to say she must've been in her fifties. It was a group of women sat beside me. And just to give you also an era, a, a, an indication of the era, a woman was singing the, the, the Megan Trainor song. She was singing the lyric this way though. She was like, I'm all about that bass, no trouble. And I'm like, great news. <laughs> And then during one of the songs, I can't remember which one, one of the drunk women approached me. She went, she looked at me and she went, do you want to dance? And I said, no. And, and then she said, <laughs> she this goes, is, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. And, well, and, then all she, and she just goes, are you sure? And I said, yes, go ahead. That happened. So I also went to share and I went with my friend and that happened to him there too. I think like, is it just like moms see like young men and they're like, it's my time. And I, I bet you maybe, and maybe there's also something like they're also sniffing out like the gay part of it. So they're like, I'm yeah. safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Yeah. Isn't that funny? I, can I tell you, it was like, just to give you some background also, I have had an extremely long day and I was looking forward to this interview and I was so worried that I was like, oh my God, am I going to be low energy or tired? And like literally the second I started talking to you, I like came to life. You... I'm so happy to have had the chance to like properly sort of e-meet you, I suppose. Yeah, no, and to be honest, I feel exactly the same way. I just moved apartments. Um, it's like my third day oh. and I had a sofa delivered today and it was a nightmare to set it up. And so like genuinely speaking with you has been so much fun and I really do feel like it turned the tide of my day. So thank you so much. Well, likewise. So I will just say, so I will not address you by name, but I will just say, Thank you for doing the show. And I will, hopefully we can, we can chat soon. And if ever I'm in New York, maybe we can go see a movie together. Yes, of course. And if I'm in, you're in LA, right? I will be soon-ish. I'm in Vancouver right now. Okay, great, great. Yeah, but if ever you're on the West Coast, you can look me up. Perfect, will do. All right, well, thank you so much. Have a lovely rest of your day. Thanks for doing the show. Thank you so much, you too. Bye. Well, I just thought she was so 
great. I really love talking to her. Be Kind Rewind is the YouTube channel. You should all go rate and review and subscribe to it. You know, like the videos. That's That always helps with the algorithms for, you know, someone's YouTube posts. And listen, while you're in a rating mood, you know, flip on over to this podcast page. You're already on it. And then give this, you know, give it five stars. Write a nice little review. It takes two seconds and it really helps a whole lot. Um, I am Liam Garrow on Twitter. Be sure to follow me there for all of my going ons and postings and news about the podcast. And as always, I really appreciate you listening. Have a lovely rest of your week. We will see slash hear slash, I don't know, whatever the mode of uh, interaction that exists with podcasting is. We will do that this time next week. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.